Good morning. I welcome you all to uh, our webinar. And I will be giving you a flavor of some of the things to come and the context in which that occurs. Um, my, as mentioned, my focus is on science, but we are much broader than that. Uh, so I need to provide you with a context for that. One of the intriguing facts about the CERT program is it's been around now for 25 years, and the amount of effort that's been put into cybersecurity uh, operations, research, development, transition over the last 25 years to totals 5 million hours or more of staff time. So the country has made a huge investment in this uh, capability, and we would like to share some of that with you today. What I'll start off with is by providing you with some context about how uh, the CERT program fits, the CERT division fits in within the broader scope. So first of all, we are actually part of a federal lab, a, an FFRDC, which stands for a federal, federally funded research and development center. Uh, we are one of the two DOD FFRDCs that focus on research. The other peer laboratory that we have is uh, uh, MIT Lincoln Labs. There are other DOD labs such as MITRE, IDA, um, RAND, Aerospace, and so on. Uh, and then these are also within the broader context of the, uh, the national labs, which include the DOE facilities such as Los Alamos, Sandia, Livermore, uh, Oak Ridge, and so on. So we are part of a rich history of national lab activities where the country is making strategic investments in how we solve the nation's critical needs. And for this laboratory here, we focus on software. We're part of the Software Engineering Institute that was established in 1984. Carnegie Mellon operates us, so we are one of the few labs that remain that actually is operated by a university. There used to be more. Um, we have about 400 technical staff. Our fo the focus of the Software Engineering Institute has been on software. Um, and then a curious thing happened in 1988 uh, as software was beginning to uh, create and promulgate the, the, uh, uh, the web. Uh, we started to experience some important failures. So the first failure, that, uh, in, which actually led to the creation of the CERT program, uh, was the Morris Worm in 1988. So this was back when the Internet was uh, essentially minuscule, I think 40,000 uh, hosts or something uh, on that order. Um, and it was a national incident in the sense that the White House got involved and concerned, DARPA got involved, and the CERT program was established. So that was 25 years ago. In that 25 years, things have evolved to where our mission, our vision now is to achieve assured cyber-enabled missions in contested environments. So that focuses on the fact that we serve the government, primarily the DOD, but also the DHS uh, and other government uh, uh, customers, uh, with then our capabilities also rolling out into the, uh, the broader community. With that 25 years experience, there's some important distinguishing aspects of that experience. One is we deal with customers who are in pain. Uh, as I mentioned at the top there, you know, we're kind of rooted in failure, which may seem a, uh, a bit uh, surprising. But as I'll come back to explain, failure actually is an important part of the scientific process, and that's part of the reason that attracts the scientists like me to this, this uh, uh, organization. So we have customers that experience pain. It means that they need answers quickly. They need answers that are effective um, Ultimately, they do want to handle their long-term challenges, but there's usually an, an important immediacy. Uh, we've been able to build trust, and it, that trust has spanned not only the government, but also law enforcement agencies, academia, and industry in terms of how we help the country deal with these various challenges. We have access to data. We either have data collections or uh, access to customer data, which gives us a unique ability to deal with the, uh, the scientific aspects and the uh, being able to validate the capabilities that we're developing and the challenges that we observe. And then finally, we have an operational experience and capabilities. And one of the real distinguishing components of that is that we're used to dealing with unexper previously unexperienced failures. So there are many uh, incident response teams, there are many security products out there, uh, lots of capability that's been developed, but most of it focused on failures that we understand, failures that we've seen <clears throat> repeatedly and so on. Uh, part of what we bring to the table is that ability to quickly understand failures that we haven't yet experienced. Uh, part of the work that you'll hear about today is actually how to prepare for those failures uh, with some of the resiliency work. So our goal is to produce and transition capabilities to the DoD that reduce the opportunity for an impact of cyber attacks. Um, so this cartoon kind of captures uh, some of the challenges for uh, science of cybersecurity. Uh, actually, this is not in the slide. Okay. I'll go to the next one. Uh, long past the scientific understanding. So for some, con for some context, 
It's important to realize that other disciplines have taken many years, sometimes centuries, sometimes millennia, to actually understand the scientific components of their area of, of study. You know, the Internet hasn't been around very long. The notion of cybersecurity hasn't been around very long. The notion that walking down the street, you're revealing privacy information just by the signals that your, your phone emits, uh, just by the, you know, the emails that you send in the public forums and so on. So our understanding is new. If we look at some of these other areas where, you know, the notion of uh, what really affects health, we see how that, you know, took millennia to uh, understand. Uh, one of my favorite stories is with bloodletting. Uh, George Washington actually, uh, when he had a fever, let his own blood because the veterinarian who was going to come do it for him wasn't getting there fast enough, and he knew that you know bloodletting was good for his health. Unfortunately, it ultimately led to his death. Uh, the thing that actually countermanded then bloodletting was this notion of medical statistics, where the doctors actually starting doing scientific studies to understand. Does this actually have an effect? There are cases where bloodletting does is the right thing to do. You've heard some of the leech uh, uh, treatments that are out there now. Uh, but for the most part, it's not really the right thing to do. Another one is alchemy. I mean, Newton was, uh, in fact, in, you know, it was a fervent pr practitioner of this. Uh, it certainly was supported by the, uh, uh, um, the, benef the, the, uh, the people who paid for research, the, the, the kings and, and, uh, and so on. But eventually, modern chemistry overcame that. So that's just a bit of a telling of, you know, I, I believe we're at the early, we're at the front end of our understanding of how science and security work together. Hopefully we can take a little, we can accelerate things and, and not take quite so long. And that's what I'll try and talk to a little bit here. Some of the problems that CERT addresses is that we try and frame, um, we want to be able to explain the challenges that we solve. So this is what we feel is our, our uh, value that we present to the, uh, to the nation and particularly to our sponsor, the Department of Defense, DHS. So we have persistent and pervasive uh, existence of vulnerabilities, and these are exploitable. This seems to be a fact that we can't get away from. When CERT was first created, the, D the DOD said something like, you know, the Morris worm happened, please help make that not happen again. Well, we haven't quite succeeded on that. Uh, it's a much harder problem than anyone really believed that it would be. Um, and the, dealing with that persistence is an important part of... of, of how we look at the problem of cybersecurity. We can't wish that problem away. Uh, the operational challenges of complexity, scale, and constraints is a real challenge, especially as this gets tied into infrastructure. One of the real challenges of the Internet is that almost any capability that's based on software, that's based on a system, gets better, gets more powerful as soon as you connect it to the network. So there's huge incentives to make the system more and more complex and to make connections that hadn't previously been planned for or anticipated. Finally, the third part is accounting for the in profound influence of the human elements. People are involved from the imagination, the creation, the design, the implementation, the installation, the operation, the use, the decommissioning, the, the investigation of uh, network capabilities. And that human element has been traditionally presumed to be not particularly important. It's like, well, if we put a policy out there, of course everybody will follow it. That's as we find out, is not quite true. So we need to design policies that people will actually follow. We need to design coding standards and coding practices that have the tools and support to enable people to make the right decision to create more secure and more capable systems. The meta challenge here is there's those limited scientific and engineering principles uh, at, as underpinning. So that's uh, why I actually came here, is to help encourage the development of the science of cybersecurity. What you'll see here today is that <coughs> Excuse me. Only a small part of the work we do here is actually scientific, sci you know, scientific research. We do a lot of research and development, a lot of transition. We help operationally with our customers, but part of what we have always had is that tradition, that scientific tradition, in part due to the benefit of being on campus here with Carnegie Mellon. Our approach. Um, has involved uh, this nice, this, this mishmash of, this, I should say a mashup, between the research community, the S&T community, looking at basic, taking basic research and being driven by specific DOD challenges, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the operational constraints. There's a certain type of reality <clears throat> that's imposed uh, when you go into the operational world, whether it's the financial constraints, the, uh, the, constraint, the, the limitations of uh, the workforce, um, the regulations that you have to deal with uh, that 
in the academic environment, you often can ignore or you may actually be oblivious to. So part of what we do is bring those two together into the same place to create a capability uh, for our customers, uh, for the Department of Defense to help solve uh, these challenging problems. We have uh, four focus areas, actually five focus areas. The, the underpinning one is the workforce development throughout cybersecurity, whether it's on the research side, whether it's on the forensic side, the operations side, the development uh, in, as part of the uh, uh, software development lifecycle. We're trying to create enhanced capability. Um, in terms of our history, you know, we started in the upper right-hand corner there with the, uh, the notion of monitoring, detecting, recovering from incidents. That's, that's our legacy. So we're quite good at that. But throughout our history, we've been working backwards and, uh, you know, to better serve our customers. You'll hear some aspect of these uh, uh, focus areas uh, today uh, in some form or another, so I'm not going to dwell on, dwell on these. Uh, the particular area I've been focused on is on the, the bottom left there uh, on the science of cybersecurity. Um, I like to put this slide into uh, most of the presentations I give just to remind people you know, even internally, I often use this slide. And so remind people that the, you know, scientific method isn't particularly complicated. It can be very difficult to apply. Even asking, you know, knowing what is the question you're trying to answer. Uh, one of the challenges we face with our customers often is they'll come to us with a bunch of data and say, what does it mean? If you notice from the diagram, the data is kind of at the, the low end of the process, if you will, in terms of trying to create understanding. So that's, uh, that's often a challenge. But our goal here is to get... Uh, the whole community thinking more rigorously about uh, what's going on in cybersecurity, what does it mean when they put a product out, when they put a policy out, um, have they been able to validate it, have they mailed, do they have a model of how it should work, have they actually actively tested it to verify that this best practice that supposedly um, is the, uh, uh, the, the wisdom of the experts actually has the effect that it's intended to have, and then to actually understand then the limits of uh, that effect. And that kind of come back, comes back to the notion of failure. Failure is one of the important mechanisms that informs the scientific thinking. And when something fails, the question is, you know, how do I get rid of that failure? It's, well, why did that failure? What did I not understand about what I was doing, and how does that need to change? And I think you'll see that as some of these, uh, pro these other webinars are presented, that we've uh, informed the development of our capabilities uh, with those failures. So let me talk about one of the uh, areas that I've actually been doing some work in. This is work that we do with DARPA. And just to give you a flavor of, of the challenges that we see in, in developing science-based capabilities. Uh, one of the challenges that you'll hear about later today is detecting insider threats. The notion of an insider is someone who is authorized to, do, to be in the, the organization, but then for some reason has a malicious uh, strategy, intent, uh, mission, and then the challenge is, well, how do you discover that person? Part of the work with, uh, that we're doing with DARPA is actually to create data sets that help DARPA explore the, uh, the, the efficacy of various technical solutions to that problem in terms of here's a bunch of data, you, you mash it together, how do you know who in the data is uh, an adversary, an insider adversary? And the analogy to use here is that you know, the workplace is a haystack with a lot of, of uh, uh, individuals, um, somewhat uniform, but, you know, um, and it can be a bit messy in the sense that, you know, we work on this project, we work on this pro another project, different groups have different organizations. And then from a science point of view, we want to know if, if there's a bad actor in there, the needle in the haystack, how do we find that? And what we've found is that as we evolve our thinking in terms of supporting uh, DARPA is that a, a needle is actually too easy to find. I mean, it's clearly, you know, just hold a magnet up to the, the haystack and you'll find the needle. It's more about finding a needle in a pile of needles because there's a huge amount of similarity. So the real challenge there then is how do we create a uh, simulated environment, a, a synthetic environment that adequately represents reality and does that in a valid way so that the, the, that the uh, performers within DARPA can actually run valid experiments against the data and be, be able to make a, a reasonable <clears throat> excuse me, assessment as to the likely e efficacy of their, their technologies. So the whole process of creating a needle is, uh, um, and how to do that in a, in a robust and repeatable way. That's another part of the, uh, the scientific method is to be able to make things repeatable. So part of our strategy here is also to be able to create tools 
and techniques that will be used by others, whether they're in the program or outside of the, the organization. <coughs> Excuse me. We'll go to the next slide here. Um, so part of what we've done is creating synthetic normal background data is a challenge. How do you we've developed techniques to verify that it's uh, has a degree of realism and put a metric against that. <clears throat> the um, you know, developing it at scale is also a challenge. If you want to create uh, synthetic behavior for, say, 100 people, that's one issue. But what, what does it mean when you want to create an organization that has, say, 50,000 users in it? That's a, that's a harder problem. And then part of the challenge of insider uh, behaviors is that they operate over long, potentially long time periods, especially in the es espionage case. So you may have to create a data set that is essentially at least a year, ideally more than a year in terms of uh, the data. And then you have to be able to put the malicious activities in there. A very difficult part of that is how to insert that, uh, insert those, uh, that malicious activity without it making it um, immediately noticeable as, as uh, malicious, as some inserted data. So we're particularly interested in inserting the, the malicious activity into uh, real data. Because if, you, if you're not careful, it would be like, well, obvious, all the insert, inserted data happened at 10 a.m. in the morning, so you know, it's, easy to, it's easy to identify as the, 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 the malicious data. So we want to be able to do this insertion without, <clears throat> without uh, um, creating such artifacts. Finally, you know, the, I mentioned Turing tests there. So for those of you who might not know, a Turing test is you know, if I have a computer here and a human here, and I'm interacting with them both, can I distinguish that one is the computer and one is the human? When it comes to synthetic data sets and the notion that we're injecting an artificial actor into a real data set, the Turing test there is, can I distinguish the fact that some of the actors, some of the actions here are synthetic versus some of them are actually real representations of real uh, human behavior? And we want to be able to do that in a way that uh, is, is valid for the, um, for the experiments. So that was just one, one flavor of things that we do. What, what I have up now is a sense of where the government's making investments and how it's looking at the science of cybersecurity problem on a national scale that we are uh, part of the conversation on. <clears throat> so we're part of the, uh, uh, we're part of the, the part, let's see, we're part of, part of the, I'm sorry, we're sponsored by the Department of Defense, the CTO, uh, previously uh, Zach, Zachary Lemnios, has done quite a bit of work to encourage uh, roadmaps that are looking forward and thinking about the the science of cybersecurity, um, you know, in particular things like modeling and simulation, measurement, uh, the notion of ranges, uh, has all been part of that conversation. Uh, the White House has also come out with policy statements indicating that developing a science-based uh, strategy in this area is important. Um, one of the ways that I've actually tried to promote it is in advising lawmakers, policymakers that. If you're going to make policy and law, ask for validated, ask for verified uh, capabilities and uh, policies. Uh, don't take it at face value when someone says, well, this is the right thing to do. It's like, where's the evidence? Where's the data that supports that this is the, has the efficacy uh, expected? And then finally, the National Academy uh, is also looking at the science of cybersecurity in terms of how to create a research capability and an education strategy for uh, promoting that. Uh, <clears throat> Before we go to questions here, I just want to kind of, I like this slide for giving an inventory of some of the actual artifacts that you can go and look at. One of the challenges of being an FFRDC is that we're not supposed to compete with industry. We're supposed to solve the problems that either industry doesn't have the capability to solve or for whatever reason there's not a, uh, you know, there's a gap that we need to fill for the government. So what you'll find in these tools are, you know, they're not quite products. Uh, they're meant to be tools that help others do this work better. Um, they're meant to be prototypes uh, as well as uh, proofs of concept. Um, some people actually use these in, in production. Uh, but I would, uh, I would suggest that you take a look at some of these capabilities, um, particularly if you're technically oriented or for your technical staff. Um, they're part of what's publicly available. Uh, I'm sure that many of the other uh, presenters will refer to these in various ways, but here they, here they are in one place. So with that, I believe 
I am ready for questions. Okay, great. Uh, first question, we came in from Bob asking, given that advanced adversaries are able to evade signature-based security solutions, what alternatives are on the horizon for detecting such threats? And let me know if you need me to repeat that. Again, I'll read it aloud again. Okay, so yeah, the, so the challenge is how do we deal with a, an advanced adversary who has developed the capability to evade signature-based solutions? <clears throat> it turns about this challenge has been around for about seven, eight years. I was part of a startup that actually focused on this question. It's about how do you detect zero-day attacks. But it turns out also many attacks that are out there in the wild, you can quickly evolve to, avoid, to evade uh, some of the uh, standard uh, security detection strategies. And so people have been working on this problem for a long time. A lot, the, the traditional method is anomaly detection, part of which has uh, been incorporated into some of the capabilities that we deliver to the government, especially when looking at very large-scale systems such as uh, the net flow, uh, record flow from uh, the civilian agencies or from uh, the Department of Defense. But there are other strategies that are out there, incur inclu including uh, tainted documents, including hunting pots uh, that are being evolved. One of the real challenges in the area is how to do that in a producible manner in terms of something that can be delivered at scale. Um, some of these technologies, it requires a couple people with PhDs or the people who actually wrote the code uh, to be in the room to help interpret what the meaning is. Uh, that doesn't scale well. And that's one of the real challenges uh, that we're actually helping the Department of Defense, uh, Department of Defense deal with. Next question. Okay. Uh, and again, some of these questions you may have covered during the presentation, but we got people logging in and out at different times. So uh, if we covered anything during the presentation, just bear with us, folks. We'll, we'll get through as many questions as we can. Uh, next question from Mark asking, what should policymakers consider when writing new roles, regulations, and policies for cybersecurity? So as I mentioned uh, before, the, the two concepts that we've promoted to policymakers are the notion of, of operational validity and scientific validity of a policy, of a technology, of a uh, strategy for dealing with a uh, security issue. Um, you, don't want to, you don't want to tell everybody to do everything that's not cost effective. You want to be able to point to uh, the policies and take capabilities and techniques that are effective. And you also want to be able to show what the limitations of those uh, capabilities are. Um, many times people are looking for a silver, silver bullet. Uh, in some work that we've been doing for the Department of Defense, we've been very careful to say, you know, this will protect you up to this level of threat. So you can make an investment here. It will protect you up to this level of threat. We'll do the validation work to ensure that uh, uh, it's capable of protecting it against that level of threat. But for a more sophisticated threat, um, there's gonna, you'll have to use a different strategy. So my advice to policymakers is to be mindful that there are limits, there are no civil bullets, and always ask for the data. Okay, we're getting lots of questions about where to get the slides. And just a reminder to everybody, the slides are in, there's a resource widget uh, on your control panel. All the, the day's presentations are in, in that widget. Um, we are broken off into two sessions, an AM session and a PM session. So all the presentations that are happening before 1230 will be in the AM session. The afternoon sessions will be uh, there later today. So the next question we have for you, Greg, is coming in from Justin asking, what is the role of failure in cybersecurity research and development at CERT? So, you know, as I mentioned, our origins, our DNA, are about failure. Customers come to, you know, many of our customers come to us in a state of failure uh, or denial. But <laughs> uh, failure is usually where it starts. Um, you know, in the scientific process, you know, understanding the limitations of your capability is an important part of that. So how do we take that, uh, that fundamental element of uh, where we came from and that fundamental element of the scientific process uh, and blend that together. Um, last year I was able to hold a workshop um, called the Laser Workshop, laserworkshop.org, um, where we explored what does it mean to uh, report failures in security. That's actually been a, an area that's been underreported uh, and how to publish on that. We had the opportunity to have, uh, see, was it Stuart Feinstein from uh, Gold, uh, from Columbia, um, talk about um, the notion of failure and ignorance. Ignorance was the name of his book. So ignorance and failure seem to go together. It was, it was a good type of ignorance. Um, but it's really how do you take the fact that when, you, when your expectations aren't met, I mean, that's what failure is about. You have an anticipation of what the outcome will be, how things will work out, what benefit you'll receive. 
and you really need to be able to learn from that. You know, there's certainly plenty of, uh, of sayings that indicate that you, some of your most valuable lessons will come from failure, and that's really one of the challenges and opportunities at CERT is how do we take advantage of this, this broad sense, uh, this broad experience of failures across various agencies in the, uh, the cybersecurity community to create better capabilities to do better science. Okay. Uh, from Ronald, wanting to know, uh, is the insider threat of more concern than the outside threat from hostile countries? And if so, how are they weighted? Um, from a top level, that's a diffi difficult question to answer. It usually depends upon what your mission is. If you live in a, uh, if your organization has very good high walls, as some of our uh, federal agencies do, and it's just very difficult for uh, the outside world to get in, then the inside threat is the most concerning uh, part. Uh, within any organization, though, you place a tremendous amount of trust on your insiders, so you know, they potentially have the ability to do a great deal of damage. In terms of the outside threat, balancing that, that's part of what the resiliency management model work that's been done here is allows an organization to actually make those trade-offs and make a decision for that organization which is the best investment to make. Okay, great. From Ann asking, how would science help to analyze the increase in foreign actors as a threat? How would science, say, say that again? How would science help to analyze the increase in foreign actors as a threat? Um, well, we've always had foreign actors uh, as a threat, so... Um, you know, what science allows us to do is to appreciate the nuances that uh, adversary can bring to the table. I mean, one, they're people also. So as an ecosystem of adversarialness, uh, how do we better understand that? From a science point of view, as they uh, engage us as an adversary, they create information for us to collect and make models of their behavior. So, uh, you know, it's kind of an anthropology project, potentially. Uh, and there's a scientific approach to anthropology. And that's part of what we're trying to bring to the table here is that human component and be able to leverage that, whether it's in our defense or in dealing with our adversaries. Okay, great. Right on the nose at 1030, Greg. Uh, that, that's it. Thank you very okay. much for the presentation. Thank you all for joining us.